I had to throw this in. I stopped last night. I got stuck on a detour. And I really tr think that water is the next crisis in the world, but if anyone is fundraising for water conservation, this might not be your best kickoff day in Long Lake. In fact, uh, I saw the airplane there. They didn't have any keys in it, and I thought I could call David Goodman and get some advice and just fly up. But it, it wasn't really that deep, so I was okay. <clears throat> I always start with the patent for double glass, 1865 Civil War. So the concept of two panes of glass to stop conduction, convection, and radiation is well past 100 years old. It's maybe good to back up here to eighth grade science and think of heat transfer. Transfer of heat is really by three mechanisms. Conduction, which is the hot handle on the frying pan. Convection, which is warm air rising over a radiator. And radiation, which is the total mechanism by which the heat of the sun comes to Earth because it can't conduct and can't convect. So in looking at thermal transfer through windows or anything, we really want to break it into looking at conduction, convection, and radiation. In the cross-section of a window, once you have two panes of glass, back to 1865, two-thirds of the remaining heat transfer is radiation. Conduction and convection are pretty well addressed by two panes of glass. So the reason that windows sat for 160 years without improvement is radiation is pretty hard to stop with a piece of glass. What it takes is invisible, atomically thin silver. Low emissivity glass is really atomically 74 atoms of silver. As the bathroom mirror becomes thinner and thinner, it becomes invisible, but it still has 74 atoms of silver. So silver is it's called sputtered. It sounds like a speech defect, but if you're a physicist, it's really cool to sputter. It is the atomically thin vacuum deposition, plus or minus five atoms of indium, titanium, but basically silver. So as silver becomes thin and you sputter or vacuum deposit that on a piece of glass or a piece of film, you get these magic properties. It reflects the heat, but transmits the light. There's a little compromise in the visible transmission, but basically you can transmit 80 plus percent of the light and reflect 92 percent of invisible infrared heat. So back to 1865, when you put a coating of low emissivity silver on glass, it will simply jump from an R value of 2 to 3. The R value is a measure of resistance to heat flow Sometimes you'll hear the U value. The relationship is fairly simple. R equals 1 over U. So a 0.5 U value is an R value of 2. Engineers use U values because that's what's going in the formula for thermal conductivity. But Home Depot on a Saturday morning, a more familiar reference is R value, which is the resistance to heat. It's simple in glass because R value one is a single piece of glass. R value two is two, 1865. When you put an atomically thin low E coating on double glass, you jump to R3. If you put an argon, krypton, or even xenon, the last speaker told about xenon glass, it's only one billionth of air, but xenon gas is very low in conductivity and convection. So the progressive filling of the cavity between two panes of glass with argon, which is essentially free, krypton, which is a buck a liter but does better, and xenon, which is stupidly expensive, but Amory Lovins at Rocky Mountain Institute has to have R22 glass so we get out the xenon bottle <clears throat> and it, it will jump up to an R value of 22 if we use two pieces of glass and three films in between. I should point out, I got from Japan I, a sample of glass that's the first I've seen. It's vacuum glass. Many people think that insulating glass is a vacuum. A vacuum is great. Think of eighth grade science with a bell jar, and there's a bell in the jar, and you hear the bell, and then the teacher hit the vacuum pump, and suddenly the bell is still whacking, but you can't hear it. So one obvious advantage of vacuum glass, it would be silent. It also, because back to conduction, convection, radiation, if you pump the air out, 
conduction through air and convection, they're gone. So it's only radiation. So glass jumps to R10 if you can pull a vacuum. Well, Japanese have figured out how to do it. I've left all my show and tell paraphernalia, but that third thing from the left is a vacuum piece of glass. And look carefully, you won't notice it first, but glass is very intolerant to vacuums. It'll break or it'll blow up. My first two samples in Glenwood Springs, Vail Pass, they both blew up in the back seat. If you take one square foot of glass from sea level to Breckenridge, it's 640 pounds trying to break it. Think of the weight of a column of air at sea level as 14.7 pounds. It's 9.6 up in the mountains at 10,000 feet per square inch, 144 times four, five to 600 pounds per square foot trying to break that glass when you get up to the mountains, as I found out in the back seat with my samples. So there are tiny little glass beads in between those two panes of glass that if you look carefully, you see, and that's how the first vacuum glass. It's stupidly expensive. I don't think we'll see it commercially, but at least Pilkington, the British glass company in joint venture in Japan, is coming out now with a vacuum glass that has these magic properties. The cross-section of windows is getting wider. Triple glass is becoming relatively standard three panes of glass because R's one, two, three at R3 can jump quickly up to about an R value of eight because you have more surfaces to coat with low emissivity coatings and you have more interspaces or air spaces to stop both acoustic and thermal energy. It's funny that a half inch of air between two panes of glass is about optimal. If you make it wider and wider, glass will get quieter, but actually convection kicks in and the R value will go down. So it's a soft peak, but it's a peak. So as the world moves from double glass to triple glass, you want two interspaces that are each about half an inch. Half an inch is also about the optimal thickness for argon. Krypton likes 3 eighths of an inch. Xenon likes a half an inch. Is it another benefit of gas filling? By displacing air with argon, krypton, or xenon, you both can make it narrower and the insulating value goes up. So different gases have different optimal thicknesses and the heavier the gas, lower in conductivity than the thinner the glass can be. The cross section of the windows we manufacture is made out of fiberglass. It's called pultrusion, which is a funny word. If you're making vinyl or aluminum sashes, you use pellets and you push or extrude, you force the materials out of the die. Fiberglass is pultruded. You actually take a three foot mold, 600 spools of glass thread. It looks like a, a weaver's loom in the factory. It comes into the mold. The other end has six tons of tension, big hydraulic jaws that grab and pull it out. In the top, you literally pour 35% resin, 65% glass, and out the other end comes kind of a surfboard forever. It's continuous fiberglass. The MBAs are jumping up and down, want it to go faster, but there's a finite rate at which the resin combines with the glass to make fiberglass. So it comes out, if you see extrusion of vinyl, it's going like this. Extrusion of loom just goes like this. And fiberglass, it goes about like this, just barely. But out the other end comes this fairly magic material. It has 1 500th the thermal conductivity of aluminum. Every commercial piece of glass you see in the world is held by aluminum, which is the stupidest material in the world. It's one of the highest energy materials to refine from bauxite. It's ice cube tray of thermal conductivity, but it's light and it's strong. So my crusade for the coming decade here is to displace aluminum with pultrusion fiberglass as fast as we can. There are some negatives. It's horrible to work with. It's glass. It takes black diamond tooling, and you don't just drill a hole in it on the job site. So when working with pultrusion fiberglass, we have to make frames that are precisely dimensioned so the contractors can install them with metal clips, flashes, or something, because you can feel it. It's glass, 65% glass. Uh, bad news, it's not recyclable. Good news is after 25 years, you could paint it up, perfectly paintable. 
and doing a habitat for humanity. So it's a, a forever material once you have a piece of fiberglass sash or frame. Bad news, the base protrusion is ultraviolet sensitive. Good news, it's perfectly paintable, like a Ferrari body. We finally have the capital K Kynar Architect's favorite paint pigment uh, certified in the highest level finish for a long time. We had problem in the finishing of fiberglass. We did the mayor of Boulder's house, painted his daughter's windows dark green, the paint fell off, chipped, and it was a total disaster because we tried to lose totally non-solvent based paints, low zero VOC. So finally, our finishers after 12 years have Kynar, Aquatech, and the highest rated finishes that are double baked on. So that's been a long process to come up with painted fiberglass that is environmentally acceptable and totally durable. We're doing buildings that are sticking up in the sky and you just don't go up and repaint a skyscraper. So to have finishing fiberglass in your specifications as architects or builders, you want to make sure that that finish, that coated, that paint has the highest current rating. The core of windows is often just air. Multiple pockets of air are actually fine. A coefficient of transfer between a material and air actually gets a 0.62. It's a film coefficient. You get kind of a free R value fractional jump because you force heat from conduction into convection radiation. So multiple pockets of air are pretty good. But if you really want to show off, we can get a material it's called aerogel. It's been around for 20 years. Aerogel is a material that has millions of tiny little spheres that are smaller in diameter than one wavelength of heat. So back to radiation, conduction, convection, if you pull a vacuum on aerogel, they're gone. So you're left with just radiation. But an infrared heat can't even do one sine wave wavelength because it's in a material that has walls that are smaller than one wavelength. Then it goes to R40 per inch. We did 52 windows for Antarctica. Average temperature outside, minus 56. I was on Wikipedia for trivia. Uh, lowest recorded temperature by man is minus 128.6 Fahrenheit. That's 10,000 feet in Antarctica. So we wanted to really show off and see how we could build windows that had material inside. So it's called Nanopore, if you're making notes, look at nanopore.com, it's actually a New Mexico company that is making shipping boxes for drugs that can go to Jakarta on a ship and they don't have to refrigerate because the insulating value of the container is so phenomenal that we use that same material and it's not that expensive. It costs us about $2.50 per foot to put it inside the surface. So I see straw bale houses and I see wide walls, but if you think of the value per cubic foot of a built structure, and if you count from the outside in, it's certainly tempting to have a material that would be at that cavity of, of R40 in one inch. I don't think it's feasible for regular constructions. It's being used in refrigerators, to buy more space, it's being used in mobile homes, in walls, so keep an eye on, it's an aqueous form of of aerogel that would take windows to phenomenal new levels. That's a cross-section close-up. Now, with due respect to my competition, Marvin Windows, I grew up in Duluth, Minnesota, 37 below, although I was upstage. Somebody said 40 below in uh, Lake Placid? So I was, my ego was tweaked at dinner last night. I was downstage by a colder place. But in the first breath of air, 37 below will really wake you up. <clears throat> And Marvin is in Warroad, Minnesota. I first know, knew a father's love playing ice hockey. by two front teeth there in the Zamboni down in Minneapolis. And I was in Warroad, <laughs> 27 below zero. We were kids, we were skating around, it was just fine. That's where Marvin Windows is. But my dad was out there just blue, just flashing blue in the third period. I said, that must be what it means to be a dad. So that was my first introduction to Marvin Windows in Warroad. So they actually use pultrusion fiberglass as well in one of their product lines. Their sash is not quite as wide to go up to these super insulating values, but it's just a difference of market segment. So lots of respect for Marvin Windows. 1974 was the first time in MIT's basement that they figured out the vacuum deposition sputtering process. We could only make windows that were one foot wide 
pretty severe market limitation. But that, the current machine is $18.4 million, uh, three and a half megawatts of power to make our film that goes in between. But the prototype machine was done at MIT. And then I think 16 years later, we did their library. So you can see the reflective dome of MIT on the right. That's a pretty tough environment because Boston is pretty cold. That's the rare book section. They keep it 40% relative humidity and warm glass will condense if it goes at 40% inside outside. And also it's the rare book section. So we now block 99% of ultraviolet light. A coincident benefit of suspended films between glass is that film goes from DuPont to in Wilmington to Japan to be XUV inhibited. It sounds inefficient. In fact, with some hypocrisy, we just did a lead platinum building in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and they took their uh, region. We're 499 miles, so they're within 500 miles, but the film went from Wilmington, Delaware to Japan to Dresden, Germany to be coated by boat to Oakland and came to uh, us in Colorado, then to Jackson Hole, and the frames are actually from Albertini in Verona. So I think I added up 17,413 miles. The materials have been, we put it all together in Boulder and we're 499 miles from the job site. So it was kind of a bogus two points. But the, the film, yes. <clears throat> the fi film by being treated provides the additional benefit. So all of our glass is 99.5% at least ultraviolet blocking. We just did all of the 99 monumental windows in the National Gallery of Art, which is free. Next time you're in Washington, go in and turn right into the sculpture gallery. And you're looking through glass, suspended film, and glass. We had to have to Krypton in that example because of condensation to keep the National Gallery at 72 Fahrenheit, 50% relative humidity. That's tough. And then at zero degrees, they want zero condensation. That's easy to do on the top, easy to do in the middle, but windows get colder and colder by convection. There's a little waterfall coming down. So we lost 11 degrees of temperature between the top and the bottom of the National Gallery windows. So the bottom outside corners, this little tiny bit of fuzz, our specs had no observable condensation and we just barely passed. In fact, in order to pass there, we had to use a smarter spacer. I think I have a slide later, but in my lineup of show and tell things here, you'll see a spacer. Insulating glass obviously has to have something to hold this, this two pieces of glass apart. And we like to use steel. Steel is 80% less conductive than aluminum, but it wasn't a good for the National Gallery because we still had condensation. So the top of the spacer, that's the little frame there, is actually polyester. So most windows, for the part that you see between the glass now, I think Marvin probably exclusively uses something other. For years it was aluminum but aluminum is an ice cube tray, and then steel is better than aluminum. But most new windows, for at least the top cap, the part that you see in between the two panes of glass has to be something of super low conductivity. So for the National Gallery, and now as a standard option, we use three sides of steel down inside, but the top cap that you see here is actually polyester. <clears throat> this is... The last of 14 buildings we've done for the University of Colorado, $63 million, it's an art gallery, so they maintain it at 42% relative humidity, which is hard. And Colorado gets super cold in the wintertime, and that's this fiberglass framing with directionally tuned glass. If you think of the role of a window in the north and the west, they're radically different in function. The west glass has to see afternoon sunshine. An overhang to Utah doesn't keep the sun out at three o'clock in the afternoon. It's too hot and too bright. So we use a different coating on the film for west glass. North glass is fairly easy, especially this is the art school. So they want high light, super insulation, but nobody cares particularly about the heat gain. Even though it gets a little shot in the morning, north glass is high light, super insulation, but no particular concern for knocking the heat out. As the sun comes around to the east and the south in Colorado, the air conditioning load kicks in, so we go to a radically different coating on south and east glass and west glass. It's just a different coating of indium, titanium, and silver. 
the three statistics you'll see if you go to a Saturday morning home show, there's a sticker by the NFRC, National Penetration Rating Council. The NFRC puts three statistics on windows. First is the U value, remember U and R value, so the lower the better. It's hard to sell something with where the lower is better, but U value, low is good. The second statistic is called VT, visible transmission, it's just the light transmission. And the third one says SHGC, solar heat gain coefficient. It's a pretty easy statistic. It tells you the percentage of total incident outside energy in heat that comes through. So a 0.24 SHGC means that 24% of the heat is coming through, 76 is rejected. That's a very low SHGC. That's a, a west-facing glass for us. And the telltale statistic of a good commercial window is a ratio of light over heat. It's called the SHG. So the, the higher the light and the lower the heat is generally good for a commercial window. In this region, that's a disaster, though, for a north and an east window. It just intuitively, I would guess here that you would like a high SHGC for sure in the north, probably on the east. And the south is a real toss-up. Whether or not you want high heat gain through southern windows is a completely a function of architecture good passive solar architecture with the basic characteristics of <coughs> overhang in the summer, seasonal foliage, and perhaps some <coughs> movable insulation. It empowers you, enables to use high SHGC, high heat gain glass on the south, which is almost categorically a mistake in commercial buildings, unless they're really designed to use that. So this building is a good combination. The other thing is we Hold all the perimeter baseboard heating. The holy grail in economic payback of commercial glass is to change the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system to pull those kind of ugly, bulky radiators that are so characteristic in most commercial buildings. So in this building, by going to super insulating glass with film and krypton, we cost the project my numbers are here, right? I think 263,000 extra dollars, and we saved 242,000 by eliminating perimeter baseboard heating underneath the glass. So you could sit in the front yard and wait for the financial payback on this uh, size building. Once, once in every 10 projects, we can do that if we get to super insulating glass and save you the space and the cost of heaters underneath the glass. That's the inside. Those tall black frames are fiberglass, which is the first real commercial use at that scale. But if you touch it in the wintertime, it's really warm to the touch because it has this magic 1 500th, the thermal conductivity of standard aluminum. This is a project. It's public if you're in Morristown, New Jersey, LEED Platinum. The fun thing here is that's the historic district. We had to look like steel windows. We had to not, well, kind of trick the Historic Landmark Preservation Commission into thinking it looked like old steel. So it's painted kind of a patina of flat gray, but the glass is one and three eighths overall to give us triple glass. The north glass has a twin coated film highlight no concern for heat, and the south and the west has a different coating to have high light but very low heat. And note the overhangs here. So there's an example exactly backwards of what I said a minute ago, where in some institutional commercial architecture, if you have overhangs over the windows, that gives you freedom, freedom to use a higher SHGC. So seasonally you can get more heat without the direct shot of summer sun. I just put this slide in because it so nicely complements the last presentation here of daylighting. If you have the luxury of high glass, then we will put very high glass. If you look at glass sideways, it looks green. That's iron. Iron is put in glass when they melt the sand to make the glass because it makes it float better on molten tin to make it flat. If you take the iron out, you get higher daylight and higher heat transmission. So low, low iron glass is clear. It doesn't even look like clear. It looks spooky like plexiglass because it doesn't have iron. So this upper glass above the light shelf is low iron crystal clear glass 
with higher heat transmission so the light is bounced deep in the space. Another characteristic here of the architecture is an open plan. So the idea of who gets a perimeter office around the outside of the building, that's really going away. We're doing work with Google's headquarters in Mountain View and it's all open plan. So every lumen bounces in and gets deep in that space. But, but you can't do that down low because we all sit and look at computers all day long and you have, I sit with a baseball hat until I did the same thing in my own office because it's too bright in contrast. So is it, back to our windows here, <laughs> windows that are high above light shelves have radically different characteristics because you can blast the light as long as it doesn't see an eye looking at a computer terminal. This was done by Rocky Mountain Institute. This is <clears throat> the headquarters of the Geraldine Rockefeller Dodge Foundation. So they had $200,000 of consulting just on the energy and the daylighting and they use kind of a black shade. It still lets some light in but that's the complement to an office in which you're looking at a computer. You just cannot put bright glass right in the view plane of all of us that look at computers all day. It's nice to have it at night or on a gray day, you just pop up the shades. Oh, uh, <laughs> is Willa here. This is, <laughs> our, NRDC has been such a leader, champion. In fact, I'm gonna get to the Empire State Building in the morning. The owner of the Empire State Building is Tony Malkin, a strong supporter of the NRDC, so I keep bumping back and forth in the NRDC, and I met Willa Bunyo, who is in the office there, and she's my prototype of comfort, because even though we're normally selling windows based on financial payback, what we're really selling is comfort. And if you look at the, <coughs> I have one study, it's 94 single-spaced pages on nothing but comfort of people sitting next to windows. And it concludes on page 94, that there are five basic things that determine our comfort as humans sitting by a window or sitting anywhere. Number one is air temperature, but that's only at best about half. Air temperature is about one half indicating how you feel. Number two is radiant comfort. The radiation that you see, the view factor of what your exposed hand or face sees looking at a warm wall or a cold window in Lake Placid. Uh, number three is relative humidity. Number four is air velocity. If an HVAC engineer has to keep blowing cold air to tell you you should be comfortable, that's a disaster. And the fifth is actually human activity level. You might assume default sitting on your butt in an office, but if you're pedaling a bicycle in an exercise gym at, in New York or something, that obviously would call for different glass design because you're actually generating, what, 600 BTUs per hour. But of the four variables, <clears throat> well, as my prototype, this 90 plus page paper was written for a person sitting one meter away from the glass because it's that specific. And if we did our job right in these windows, they will set the air temperature about two degrees warmer in the winter, no, lower in the winter and higher in the summer. Not to save old dinosaurs and ferns, but truly equivalent comfort. If you're sitting a foot away from a piece of glass or a meter here, standard single glass in the winter, and winter is in quotation marks because the engineering society defines winter. That's 70 inside, zero outside, 15 mile an hour wind. That's just a common denominator okay. of winter. Now under those conditions, a single pane of glass is 16 degrees, double 44 or 66. That's the difference. If warm glass in the winter is within several degrees of room temperature, then you will get up without thinking over to the Honeywell thermostat. You'll crank the thermostat down a couple degrees to be truly equivalently comfortable. Now the reciprocal summer is maybe even more important because buildings are more expensive to cool than to heat. It takes pumps and chillers and professors and, and uh, belts and fluids and things to cool the building. So if you just put a piece of bronze glass to stop the summer heat, you may statistically stop its transmission, but that piece of glass can go to 120 degrees. That's disaster for the second component of comfort because that glass is radiating to your cheek. And you'll get up and go back to the thermostat and crank it down and down and down and tell Honeywell to dump more refrigerated air on your head because that glass is broadcasting to your face and making you feel warm. Human skin is about 90, 91 degrees. Our glass is 83 degrees in the Empire State Building. So that second order 
radiant comfort effect is more important than the air temperature. And that's why we're basically selling comfort for people. This is uh, Francis Beinecke's office in the lower right. So it looks the same as standard glass, but now that we've replaced the glass in four stories of this beautiful old New York building, you're looking through glass, suspended film with the 74 atoms of silver, and then we have krypton gas, and the outer pane of glass has another low emissivity coating. So this glass went from an R value of two to eight, but it looks the same by virtue of two. Now, <laughs> these windows we didn't change and the windows only have a one inch glass pocket. As you see up here, we like to be one and three eighths to one and a half, but we got the same performance by switching from argon gas to krypton glass, because krypton does the same thing, but it does it faster. So the NRDC is on our, our champion list. Now uh, this for fun, <laughs> this is last night. I just wanted to compliment the uh, Wild Center. It looks like the last supper here or something. <laughs> but thanks to Dave, we had a wonderful, wonderful meeting and it's always fun to come back here and I Compliment the Wild Center. Boulder Library's been a tough design. This is probably too much glass, even so. Solar energy goes up about 3% per 1,000 feet. So back to Breckenridge, it's easy to do. And you had 10,000 feet times three. The sun is actually 30% stronger. If it reflects off the snow, it can even get greater than the extraterrestrial constant with a National Center of Atmospheric Research measured in Aspen on a southwest elevation more BTUs per square foot than Hubble sees in outer space. So, in fact, we won the 1980 National Design Award for Klaus Obermeyer's building in Aspen. Three months later, we were back there in our blue jeans, taking out the west glass, putting gray glass, putting shades and blinds. It was kind of welcome to the mountains to the boys that didn't know what life in the mountains was like. So high altitude glass has a tougher life. And here, the ultraviolet was critical to block the direct sunshine on the books. We have three different kinds of glass. North glass is easy. The west glass is very hot in Colorado, and this has skylights. We actually put a tinted bronze glass in the skylights just to knock more heat out of the overhead sun. We have six prototypes in the Transamerica Pyramid building. In 1972, it's kind of assumed to be a modern building. It has disaster glass. It's all one pane of single glass but the sashes and frames are wide enough to allow us to sneak back in and we're putting one and one quarter inch glass back. So we have these prototypes that are both quieter and seven times the insulating value. This, <laughs> this will be quick. This is the uh, 94 page paper on human comfort. They use something if you have a computer bumps, it's CFD, computational fluid dynamics, $40,000 software that by view factor kind of simulates how you feel because it looks at the variables that determine comfort. And these lower two windows, that's the Pfizer building. Pfizer headquarters, 335 42nd Street in New York City. Total disaster, it's been 1958, they've been sitting next to single glass, but they have these same wide windows as the pyramid building. So we think the world doesn't need that many new buildings, so the bulk of our current marketing focus is to find old classic buildings that have windows that are inherently geometrically compatible with wider glass, and then through those sashes and frames, see if we can re-engineer glass that has six, seven, eight times the insulating value and get it back in those sashes. The Boulder Library, Radiant Comfort here, it's fun because the old section of the library is still there. That has single glass, and we're at R7. The kids' reading room in the old section is two stacks. They had to hide the kids behind two stacks of books on a wetter day just to read books. And here, I should have photoshopped some kids in, but here the reading room and the rocking horse are back close to the glass, providing further evidence of that most important factor is comfort, because the glass here really did go from 16 degrees to 66 degrees on a cold, on, on a winter day by the ASHRAE definition. And this is a fun one. This started about three years ago. We had a design meeting on the 32nd floor that happened to be empty. In fact, the building's always been kind of a commercial disaster. It was 26% empty when we found it three years ago for a renovate. 10,411 people on a day, average day, 10,400 go up for 18 bucks. So they're okay in cash flow, but the actual real estate space was kind of laggard. It was nowhere near class A commercial office space. 
So we had 32 people for six hours in a design competition charrette. And on the blackboard, at 9 o'clock in the morning, we had 37 things you might do. Heating, ventilating, air conditioning, windows, clean the building in the day instead of turning the lights on all night. Anything we could think of that might make sense. And one and a half years later, and $107,000 of energy modeling, we came down to eight things to do. And the number one was controls, just impeccable controls of lighting, heating, cooling, air conditioning. Number two was windows, and we were, no, number two was lighting, do complement to the last, and number three was windows. But they're all intertwined. You can't separate, obviously, light and windows because we wanted to make maximum use of the natural light in the windows. <clears throat> so the final solution was an empty space on the fifth floor. We actually set up a little mini factory. We took our glass washer apart. We took the film machine. The spacers that are bent didn't even fit up the elevator, so we had to carry them up five floors. And we built a little mini factory on the fifth floor. And we took apart 13,028 pieces of glass. That's twice the windows, because each window has two pieces of glass. Cut them apart, saved 472 tons of glass, put them back with argon, krypton, gas, and film. Different film for the north, because we didn't care about heat. I thought the Empire State Building might like a little east morning heat. I got totally busted by Con Ed, because Consolidated Edison charges you 35 bucks for every peak thousand watts you draw in the summer. I guess Manhattan is absolutely constrained. They just cannot put more bundled electricity into Manhattan. So we got major credit for knocking the heat out of the light. We took 36% of the load of incident solar heat off the air condition. In fact, the major payback factor was buying another projected 10 years of life for the air conditioners. There's no roof on which to put an air conditioner. It's a wedding cake. So every of the five steps of the layer, each of those is an HVAC floor. They blow things sideways. So we bought 10 more years of air conditioner life by taking 56% of the heat load coming through the glass off the air conditioner too. And Manhattan's goofy. Fifth Avenue is 28 and a half degrees to the east of north. So all my intuition of north, south, east, west went out. It means the east is south of east and it's too hot. So once again, north glass was easy. All other three elevations wanted the most light they could have but the absolute least heat. So we used a film on the north that goes through the $18 million machine twice. It has low E coatings on both sides of the film. And then the south, east, and the west have a, a super low heat transmission coating. So in cross-section, that's the before picture. And then we put the film in the middle. And argon and krypton gas, south and west. And those are the numbers for the engineers. 72% down in U value. So the new our value on the north went from about two up to eight. And the net effect has been spectacular. We got busted on the 86th floor, which is the observation deck because the Landmark Preservation Commission wanted it crystal clear. All of these coatings, low E glass and low E film, have a little color, a little tint, especially if you look through Polaroid sunglasses. So <clears throat> that's actually right picture I took through a polarizing filter on the camera. You see it shifts a little bit purple, a little bit green. So we finally went back to low iron glass. I explained before low iron is the stuff that's not green. That's off PPG's website. So if you have a polar bear and your polar bear is looking a little, a little greenish, you can fix that by using PPG low iron glass that they call Starfire. So the glass on the 86th floor is double low iron with a clear film, but it's very hot. So we, we had to forego the optimal thermal performance in order to meet the requirements for optical clarity for the Landmark Preservation Commission. And the real story to me, the Empire State Building, is what it's done to the value of the building and the participation of the tenants. The 32nd floor where we did our design meeting three years ago is now Skanska International Headquarters. They're competing with 11th and 12th floor, FDIC. A Chinese trading company just took 500,000 square feet. The whole building is being on the elevator. They have kind of a competition of who has the most efficient floor. It's kind of the opposite of how long you can stay in a hot shower in a motel because it's free. And to make things worse, you, to, <laughs> to make buildings work, in fact, I saw some study 
Johnson Controls was the ESCO, the Energy Service Company. They put up the money, they financed, they've become kind of the utility company for the next 12 years. So they're desperately trying to get everyone to get on the bandwagon and make it fun to save energy. And that's really tough in a commercial building. But it seems to be working. In fact, this was uh, Wall Street, no, this in the New York Times two weeks ago. Tony Malcolm is actually turning this into a public stock offering because he's gotten so much hoopla out of what we did collectively to the Empire State Building. He's going public with this and a couple of others. I don't know if it'll work, but it really has, it's the number one publicity event in the history of Johnson Controls, which is a great big 155,000 person multinational company. And then you know, in contrast to that, my hometown of Duluth, Minnesota, just got a check written to them for $4.3 million because Johnson Controls and the schools program didn't meet the target. Energy performance contracting is pretty scary because you write a check if you miss your projection. I think the, the mission here is to coincident with retrofitting old buildings, is get everybody on board, put a little competition on the elevator, make sure that everybody finds it fun to go home and tell their kids that they were in a green building. Somebody said, I saw one psychological paper that 60 plus percent of the performance of a building after LEED certification could be a function of participation. Kind of a fuzzy figure, but. Uh. So this is uh, a Smithsonian. We've done four buildings for Smithsonian. They had lots of old aircrafts and space capsules. So this is down in Hampton, Virginia. It's green glass on the outside. It has three different kinds of glass, so it wakes up in the morning, gets progressively cool in the afternoon, and ultraviolet was important because they have a lot of fragile old skin aircraft. <coughs> this is the cross-section evolution, the lower left. That's actually the frame of the National Gallery of Art. They called it poured into bricks. Aluminum is so disaster that it flunked the condensation test. So each of those black cores, that's polyurethane, they make a hole in the aluminum, they pour polyurethane inside, and they cut the aluminum out to take the conductivity from the aluminum away. But fiberglass, it will be strong enough to do that. So we're working on our first building in Saudi Arabia that is actually a full bore commercial building with pultrusion fiberglass frames. This it's the latest, even the aluminum people are starting to use fiberglass in cross section. Those little webs that hold the inside and the outside of this curtain wall. There are three words in commercial architecture for glass. Storefront, that's a shopping mall, one of them. Curtain wall means more than one story without any vertical support. It has to hold up the wind load. So two or more stories of glass that can't touch anything is curtain wall and then standard commercial windows. So this is the world's first insulating curtain wall that has an insulating R value above five. This system allows us to pull the plug on perimeter baseboard heating, that the holy grail objective I mentioned. This is the funny end of poltrusion. This is a wonderful crusader for fiberglass. I'll do a cup in Canada. But it looks like Rapunzel's hair or something when you're done. See all the glass fuzzy strands on one end and out the other end comes this material. It kind of looks like vinyl or something but it is uh, it's fiberglass. Fiberglass expands less than aluminum. In fact, it's 65% glass, so to the degree it moves, it moves right along with what it's holding. It's glass holding glass. Sound is kind of a coincident benefit. As you make windows wider, you pick up two or three SDC sound transmission class points. They say it takes about three SDC points to be noticeable, side-by-side -side offices. So as a coincident benefit of wider windows, windows are getting cooler and quieter at the same time. This on the top picture, that's the $18 million, three and a half megawatt machine that coats the film. Doesn't sound very energy efficient to use three and a half million watts of power to save energy, but once they turn the machine on, it makes a, a mile long film, 35,000 square feet of film. So the film is then sent around the world, and down below is the platform. We go glass, spacer film, spacer glass, put it in the oven for two and a half hours to pull the film, and then we have a sandwich that looks like double glass, but is really triple. Another quick look at fiberglass. Of 17 below zero, I was north of Duluth. Normally, I had don't have to look south at my hometown, but 17 below zero. And this l upper left picture is a storefront piece that looked like aluminum, but it's fiberglass. It was almost warm to the touch. Insulating values, we said before, there's the old patent of R2. R3 is three panes of glass, R5 with low E coatings, 
And actually our Amory Levins Rocky Mountain Institute has an honest R value of 22, twice what I show in the slide, but it's three films, four layers of xenon gas, two layers of low E, stupidly expensive, but at least it's fun to show that you can go beyond R20 with two panes of glass in weight, as long as you keep your wallet on. Glass performance is now is totally done. This is a free downloadable program, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, paid for by our tax dollars. It's a very friendly program. They also have some other programs that take two PhDs to understand, but the Windows program from Lawrence Berkeley you, it has every glass in the world, every film in the world. So you make a sandwich. It says, what glass would you like outside? Could be clear or green. What film, what gas? And you punch the button and it tells you 17 times what you ever wanted to know. Cross-section, temperature, sound, heat, light, but you can throw away glass catalogs forever, and it's a free, friendly program. Fiberglass windows, looks like vinyl, but that's fiberglass. If you take six feet of vinyl, like the threshold of a door, and change temperature 100 degrees, given Aspen Day, you can easily go from a, a March morning at five below to the surface of a window being at 120. So six feet of vinyl, 120 degrees, 100 degrees, tries to move a third of an inch. So it's still the number one. In fact, 62% of the windows in the U.S. are still vinyl windows. And it's okay once thermally it's okay. But it's process manufacture and its use will, I'm very confident, be eventually displaced by fiberglass or perhaps other composite materials. Cool. Painting? You have to paint fiberglass anyway, so it's freedom for architects to get away from bronze and clear anodized rooting, purple windows and yellow windows and dark red windows. And these are it's a hundred million dollar ice skating rink, upper left, design temperature 10 degrees below zero. And I kind of forgot that ice, 34,000 square feet of ice, NHL hockey rink is actually all water, so it does humidify over time. So we had two ice rinks at 10 below and had to keep the condensation off the glass. Watching my time, that's the, the storefront at 17 below in Winnipeg that was actually warm. Here, exotic new glass types. Every surface of a building will eventually make electricity. Last week I got a call from Stanford University. Two PhD scientists have figured out a coating that actually extracts photovoltaic energy but remains clear. It's a nanostructure fluid that goes on as a coating. We can make a BIPV, is Building Integrated Photovoltaic. I mean, chimneys make electricity, roofs already make electricity, all surfaces will, but it's pretty tough to have a window that is coincidentally transparent, but at the same time makes electricity and that's apparently happening. We've done many, this is kind of a bad picture, but if you do 80% PV cells, 20% clear glass, it's still enough vision, kind of like a bad television or a bus window. Your brain kind of fills back in what's missing. So you see more and more windows that have integrated photovoltaic cells. It's, especially, it's fine for skylights and upper glass, and still you can see a cloud or a tree, an airplane between it, but the real uh, magic may be a clear material that makes electricity and takes those wavelengths sensitive to PV conversion, but still operates as a clear window. And I think we're done. Condensation? This is really tough. This building got LEED platinum, uh, LEED silver certification, and I have to drive by it every day, so I'm going to give them. See, the center of glass is fine. It's the lower outside corners by convection and conduction that condense and then mold and the Condensation is disaster to insulating glass because it finds its way down inside the glazing pocket, starts to eat away at our sealant. So condensation should be absolutely gone, even in this climate. If the sash and the frame and the glass are all at this category, you'll never see humidity on the glass unless you get above 50 or 60 percent. And this was finished. Now for $11,800, you can walk up to a pane of glass, pull the trigger, and this device will tell you if the argon is all gone. It's a Tesla coil from Nikola Tesla, the great physicist, throws an arc, reads the color of the arc, tells you, they used to use a hypodermic needle to go in and see if the argon is still there. Now you just walk up, pull the trigger after you pay your 11,000 bucks, and it tells you if the argon is still there. This is the thermal leg spacer that I have on the uh, Art Institute. We just finished six galleries here. We can do Many a gallery. And I always do this. Amory Levin says, 
that first order, the total BTU energy content at the maximum pumping, which I guess is the 4th of July, is about what we're blowing right out the windows. We can stop 85% of it right now, and it's 27 years old and it's leaking. So good windows and turn off the pipeline. A little simplistic, but and that's the end of my spiel. Thanks. Thank you.